practical variability of three thirds. Um, she had uh, appointments um, thereafter at the U.S. Naval Academy and the University of Edinburgh before coming to the Herbert Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in the High Energy Assistance Division, where she works on a time domain spectroscopic survey of quasars, looking at how they vary, uh, how their spectra vary in time, some of them quite dramatically. And yeah, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, this class of, of highly variable quasars we call changing look, because they, they seem to exhibit uh, very strong spectroscopic variability, um, particularly in, the, in their emission lines and in their continuum. And um, we're still striving to understand them. So, I'll, I'll, um, so what I'll do is first explain what they are um, and the observations that we've done of changing look quasars. Um, and, I'll, and, and explain the different spectral types that you expect for, for quasars and AGN. And for the purposes of this talk, quasars um, are the same physical beasts as AGN, just at higher redshift, so they appear as point sources. Can you define what AGN is? Um, active galactic nuclei, yes, thank you. Okay. Yes. There are some people here that don't always know what an AGN is. Okay, I, I apologize, yeah, I just kind of assumed, but um, yeah, supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. Uh, and uh, then after explaining the observations, I'll go into the interpretation and what we think might be going on and implications observations may have on broadland region structure and, um, uh, theor and, and, and for theor theoretical time scales in AGN. So here's just a schematic of what um, we expect the structure to be roughly around supermassive black holes and active galaxies. As you have the accretion disk at the center here. Um, where's that little? Oh, here, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, which uh, is a, a disk like structure uh, surrounding a supermassive black hole from which it's accreting matter. Uh, and in the vicinity, you have this region called the broadline region. Uh, which is responsible for emitting the broad emission lines that we see in the spectra. So here's an optical spectrum of a type 1 quasar, um, where uh, you see these broad Balmer emission lines um, due to very fast moving gas um, in the potential well. Um, so then there's another type of, a spectral type of, of quasar that you see uh, called type 2, where you don't have the broad emission lines, but you still have the, the narrow emission lines, which are presumably coming from a narrow line region, um, which is extended and not obscured by this dust structure. So this is the unification model of, of aging. Um, however, you also have type 2 spectra for AGN, which do not show any signs of dust, dust obscuration. So they don't seem to fit into the, this unification scenario where it's just you know, a difference in viewing angle to the central engine. Um, and it's hypothesized that the lack of broad emission lines, and here's the H beta line, here's the H alpha line, the lack of broad emission lines in the spectrum is due to um, uh, something having to do with the accretion rate. So below a certain value of luminosity or um, the Eddington ratio, or a parameter related to the accretion rate, you um, you can no, no longer support a broadline region, um, and therefore uh, this uh, and, and this so-called in the certain model called the disk wind model for the broadline region, um, the emission lines go away. So changing look AGN are those that exhibit both types of spectra, type 1 and type 2, for the given quasar over time. Um, so here, as I'm just showing a zoom in on the H beta line again, um, here's a, you know, a 1974 spectrum of, of NGC 4151, uh, and you can see the broad component there on top of the narrow component, which then changes to this spectrum in 1984 where the broad line has, has gone away, both for H beta and for H gamma. You're left with only the narrow emission lines. And this presents a puzzle uh, to explain because we don't really expect the accretion rate to change so dramatically over such a short time. Um, because the accretion time scale, or the, it's, it's supposed to be um, related to the viscous time scale of the disk. 
related to the disk viscosity. So here's your accretion disk. The, the time it takes for things to flow in with the accretion flow is really long for the optical emitting part of the accretion disk, 10,000 years. So that's why it's kind of puzzling to explain these observations. Um, so you must invoke some sort of instability in the disk, like um, such as you know the thermal instability or something happening on these time scales to explain the short time scales that you observe. Um, also, or you could have uh, something like a cloud of dust that moves in along the line of sight, and then um, that is responsible for blocking out the broad emission line region and continuum part of the accretion disk. And this happens on um, 24 years, give or take. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, these are these are kind of time scales we expect. But so the dynamical time is short. It's one year. In, in the broadband. Yeah, well, okay, so for for um, for for luminous quasars, which are going to be the ones I'm talking about mostly, yeah, um, you expect it to be about a few years. Um, so five, five oh, three to five years, yeah. That can occur if you have something there. It um, yeah, are you, now, are you talking about um, the dust obscuration or something that's... Something that blocks our view. Blocks our view, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it, it could, it, well, okay, so, yeah, so for, for these kind of times, so, so keep in mind, though, you have to be able to block the entire broadband region, um, so you have to be kind of fur, further out, which lengthens your time, your Keplerian velocity. Um, but I'll get into why we don't think it's the obscuration scenario. Okay, so uh, to try to resolve this, or try to try to uh, understand this phenomenon, changing with quasars. These are observations that we've been doing. Um, so recently, these uh, changing look quasars at higher redshifts than 0.1 have been discovered in, in survey data, and this is thanks to just the availability of repeat spectra becoming um, with coming out from these survey telescopes, such as uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and um, also the the long time baselines now that are being probed. Um, and uh, here is a diagram of their luminosity of the O3 line, which is a good proxy for the luminosity of the, of the quasar. And um, this is uh, the redshift. So you can see um, in the red, changing with quasars, and in black, these historical changing with AGN that we've known about um, for, for, for decades now. Um, and there's a handful of them that it's, you know, it, mostly argued to be some sort of accretion rate, a change or, or a, a change in ionizing flux uh, coming from the accretion disk. Um, but, but there's also some studies that um, indicate that you know, maybe it's all, it could be variable obscuration, something moving in along the line of sight. Um, and here is a list of the changing with quasars um, discovered uh, to, up to date. And um, you can see that there's, there's fairly a few. I mean, there's maybe around 50 that are now um, known about, and yeah, so it's kind of a rare phenomenon, but some of that has to do with the fact that we just kind of lacked the sort of data that you need to detect these changes, the repeat spectra for the same quasar. Are these broadening and narrowing? These are the same thing we were showing before. This is the same thing I was showing before. So this is just based on bomber line disappearance or appearance. It can go either way. Uh, so here's um, a couple examples that came from one of the systematic searches we did through the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So here, um, which the technique I used was just to go through all the photometry that's available for quasars, spectroscopically confirmed quasars in the SDSS survey, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, that um, are, appear also in pan stars, which is a later survey, photometric survey, um, that happened a decade later. And compare just simply comparing magnitudes and find those that change by over one magnitude, which is pretty rare for for quasars. Um, and these these examples pass the variability cut. Some this one actually had some extra data from the CRTS, the Catalina survey, showed in red. And they also both had um, archival spectra in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, SDSS two and SDSS three from the Boss spectrogram. Um, and so those repeat spectra are shown here for each source, 
Um, so you can see here um, the red earlier Sloan spectrum lacks a broad H beta line altogether, and whereas clearly in the in the bright state spectrum here, you see um, a stronger blue continuum and um, these broad bomber emission lines. Um, and, and the bottom panel is, is going the other way around. Now it's dimming, and these have gone away as well, along with the continuum. So this is usually what we see. Um, and we're, note, note that we're kind of restricted to the, restricted to the redshift range of um, Z less than 0.6 or 0.8 if we want to detect the bomber lines in the spectrum. And so for the source that I, I showed on the previous slide in the top panel, um, turns out that, so it's shown again here, the light curve, and it, it turns out um, that recently it has redimmed. Um, so after you know the the ten year um, going ten years going from Sloan to Panstars, now it has redimmed, um, and you can see the the bomber lines going shutting back off. And luckily, we also have repeat X-ray spectra. So X-ray spectra tell you um, it's a, it's probably the most robust way to study um, search for evidence of variable absorption because you can measure the column um, in H. And, and, and so here's uh, XMM, epoch for the XMM observation and epoch for the Chandra observation of the source. And the X-ray is dim by about a factor seven going from here to here along with the optical, but the um, shape of the X-ray spectra does not change. And in fact, you, you find no evidence for any sort of absorption in the dim state spectrum. So it's definitely for the source and for a handful of others that have the, the necessary observations, it's not likely to be due to like a cloud of gas like moving along the line of sight or a cloud of dust blocking out the light and then moving away. Okay, so here's what I spent um, the bulk of my time for this paper doing, um, which is, um, obtaining follow-up spectroscopy for changing liquidator candidates. So these are selected from the photometric surveys using the same technique as I explained earlier, but that lack recent spectroscopy, and I wanted to go back and see what they look like now. They are good candidates for um, either gaining or losing bomber emission lines. And um, so I started with a quasar catalog, about 100,000, and uh, made a, you know, a variability cut um, and going from here to here was definitely the hardest part, right? So we, we got a 130 follow-up spectra using telescopes like MMT and the Magellan six and a half meters. Um, and then among those um, measured, you know, the significance of the bomber line change and the, the most um, highly significant changes where you see like a three sigma dimming or brightening. Um, numbered at 16. So 16 new changing liquidators from this search, and we just submitted this paper. Here's, here's our most dramatic one. So here's the light curve. You can see it's turning off. Um, it's kind of a you know jump in the CRTS B-band data. This is um, R-band data and G-band data, which is why they're kind of offset from each other. Uh, and, and here's the, spe the repeat spectra. So the bottom in blue is the one we got from MMT. And you can see it looks very different from the earlier Sloman spectrum. Okay, so then what we did um, is uh, decompose the spectra using a spectral decomposition code QS fit, and this fits power law continua, a host galaxy, um, broad emission lines, narrow emission lines, the iron template, and uh, a Balmer continuum to the whole spectrum. And here I'm just showing a zoom in of the H beta region with the O3 emission lines. Um, and so we, you can see we're de decomposing H beta into both the narrow and broad components. And once we do this, and um, then what we can do with these, these parameters is look for changes in the spectral energy density. So in other words, so th this is the flux ratio between the high state and the low state um, of the 3240 angstrom continuum. That's the blue part of the spectrum. So this y-axis is showing you the, by what factor the continuum changes. And the x-axis is showing you by what factor the H beta broad emission line changes. Okay, so um, yeah, so what so what you can do with this sort of data um, is, is look for a change in the line strength relative to the continuum that might indicate um, this the actually SEB of the of the quasar is changing. 
Um, and so uh, another thing we, we, we can do is determine the, the rate of change in the quasars among highly variable AGNs. So for these, um, for, the, for the most highest significance changes, the, the red points here, we find that, um, and this is the same y-axis I, I was showing on the previous slide, now on the x-axis showing the, the fraction of CLQs, or, or those that have lost bomber lines. Um, you can see that for the highest significance changes, uh, it, the CLQ fraction increases from 10% to roughly half as the blue continuum flux ratio increases from 1.5 to 6. Okay, and now um, getting into the interesting stuff. So, so then what we did was plotted the distribution of changing the quasars in Eddington ratio. So this is a parameter related to accretion rate. Um, and what we find, so here, here's the overall Sloan quasar distribution in the dotted. Um, in the black is a control sample, which is matched in redshift and in luminosity to our, our parent sample. Um, and then uh, in purple are the changing look quasars that are confirmed from, this, from these um, works. And um, the, this is essentially the bright state, and then the red is the dim state values, right? Because the luminosity goes down. So there's a different, so there's a shift. But you can see even in the bright state, um, these, these objects are at lower, lower Eddington ratios than um, the control sample. Okay, so then the less variable um, counterparts. So this kind of argues for an accretion disk instability, or something related with the accretion disk. What is EVQ? Um, EVQ is extremely variable quasar. But not quite a CLQ. But not necessarily a CLQ. We, we don't have repeat spectra for all of them, so it's... So you don't know. We don't know. Okay. And some of them, yeah, may, may be very close to being CLQs, but the significance just wasn't high so enough. Is it very modern? Um, yeah, I, I'd say that's small number statistics that, that this dip right there, honestly, because in other versions of this plot, it goes away when the sample size changes. I, I'd say that's it's not enough to go on there. Okay, so then um, it, what I did here was I replaced the Eddington ratio with this other parameter, which is the volumetric luminosity divided by the black hole mass to the two-thirds power. Um, this is the critical parameter in this disk wind model by Litzer and Hoth 2009, in which um, it's theorized that above a certain critical value, which is shown by red, the red line here, um, you have broad emission lines, and below a certain value, you lack broad emission lines. And this is because the uh, luminosity is low, and you, you can no longer sustain a broad line region wind. Um, so I know I didn't go into the details for the, the structure of a broad line region, but this, this is interesting to me because the CLQs, they peak in the bright states right at this threshold. And, and then when you look at the dim state values, they're all to the left of this line. So this could be uh, you know, possibly telling us something about the broadland region structure. Maybe it is in this disk wind, which is theorized by these people. However, in this paper, um, naively, you would expect this transition um, to happen on the viscous time scale, so very long time. But of course, that's not what we're seeing. So that's so then we have that's the puzzle that that we've um, crossed. So back to, to the, uh, the viscous time scale has been seen. It actually has been observed in microquasars or X-ray X binaries, um, dwarf novae in the galaxy. These are um, stellar mass black holes which are accreting matter uh, from a companion. Um, and we, we actually observe the viscous time scale where, where it's the days to months. But when you scale up to supermassive black holes, again, so it's in the 10,000 year range for the optical emitting part of the disk, and it just doesn't make sense. Um, so, so this could be presenting a challenge, it, it, you know, that maybe supermassive black holes, accretion, the accretion disk around them are more complicated than just a standard thin disk that you would expect from scaling up in mass from an X-ray binary. Okay, so my conclusions, which are interpretation of these sources, can sort of be summarized as follows. So um, we do not think 
the bomber line disappearance and the changing of behavior is due to some sort of transient event, like a tidal disruption event, star getting tidal to erupted as it, as it encounters the supermassive black hole. Um, just because the light curve shapes do not match a single flaring event like you would expect for a TBE. Also, um, I already explained why we don't think it's variable absorption by dust. Um, of course, we would like to increase the sample size of those sorts of observations that we can test that. But um, so, but we'll go for the moment. We'll just assume that this is, a, you know, related to the accretion disk and some accretion disk physics, um, as they are at lower to ed Eddington ratios than the overall quasar population. Um, and uh, and regardless of the, you know, me the physical mechanism causing the accretion disk variability we can use these observations to study the structure of the broadline region of surrounding the accretion disk. Of course, the time, so the timescales are the puzzle here, and there have been some proposed solutions. Um, one, a state transition involving an infection-dominated accretion flow, and this, this is seen in X-ray binaries as well, but what happens when you have an ADAF is um, the timescale is no longer on the viscous timescale, so that could explain why the timescales are shorter. And this paper does a really good job in exploring that scenario and, and discussing the time scales you would expect. Or you could have instability, instability driven limit cycles involving a magnetic torque at the innermost stable circular orbit, which is proposed by these authors. Um, again, um, the, the time scale is then for a cooling front propagating throughout the disk, so it, it's no, no longer the viscous time scale. Then, um, which one, this one, which I find really interesting, is that um, you could just have magnetically elevated accretion disks in all AGN. Changing the quasars are not really special in this regard. They're simply just the hypervariable tail of regular quasar variability. And, and having magnetically elevated thick disks, um, again, also decreases the, the time scales that you would expect. All right, so I will end there and take any questions. Radius to the broadline region is also the roughly the stalling radius of binary black hole systems that they should spend a lot of time there if they get stuck. That's the parking place. So could some of these be binary? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, it could be. It could be binary. Yeah, it could be a supermassive black hole binary. I mean, but then it, you would see this. Well, you would think, but do you, do you see any periodicity? I don't see any um, periodicity, but um, there are some light curves that I've that I really have asked made me ask that question because it doesn't look like a sinusoid at all like none of them look like that but there are, are is one that where it seems to be repeating some sort of behavior like a, repeating a giant flare five years later or something like this but it's it's sort of quasi periodic so that's a really interesting question yeah I think that should definitely be explored How often does this happen, and do we have enough data to tell whether this happens often and whether it happens in every quasar? Okay, so for in terms of the entire quasar population, the rate could be as um, the rate could be as, as high as I'm sorry, not the entire quasar, the, the highly variable quasar population. It could be as high as thirty to fifty percent. Um, and and what was your second question? Does it happen to every quasar, or is it just the? the oh, and you, like if you wait long enough, will it happen? Yeah, um, I don't think so. I, and and so there's a couple things that tell me this. Well, one, you know, at, at cross matching hypervariables that were found from you know one survey match the same sample of hypervariables found from matching, you know, from a different survey. So that and also the fact that there are some sources that um, I'll show you an example. They repeat this behavior, so they go, on, they go up and down again. And um, when they return to the dim states, they look exactly the same as they did. And it's not like, you know, it, a different quasar where it, when it goes back down, it looks different. It, it looks exactly the same. And so it seems like for the, there's certain quasars, when they ha show these large changes in luminosity, um, they will definitely lose the bomber lines again. It, once, once reaching that 
that flex level. So yeah, I, I don't know. That this is just sort of the way I think about it. But uh, I, we can we can talk more later. Yeah. I think we have another question. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So are any of these radio loud, and could you do interferometric imaging to really see what's happening close in? They are not like radio loud, unfortunately. Um, so from a systematic search that I did for all Sloan quasars, um, I I only found one out of ten that had a radio detection in first in the first survey. Um, but then for the follow-up spectroscopy, I, I excluded all radio sources because I didn't want to be confused by any jet-related variability. Um, but what was this? Well, this has something to do with the jet. I mean, with this. Would you find some morphological structures in the jet that would give you some clues as to how yeah. the accretion disk was interacting with the black hole? Or? Yeah, I guess you can, yeah, you get, you can't assume that there's no jet-related variability just because it's not detected in the radio, right, but um, that's, kind of, but that is the assumed assumption that I made, is that, you know, it's not detected in the radio, therefore I'm not looking at, you know, along the side of a jet or something like this. But, but this is 10,000 Schwarzschild, I mean, much farther. Your resolution is too good. No, but I'm thinking about like low frequency VLA or VLDA. Yeah. That's right. But this is like 10,000 Schwarzschild. And then just sort of following up on, on Chef's question, but there, there are these things called the OVEs, optically. Violet variables. variables. Yeah. And then they're generally associated with um, strong radio variability. So what is the relationship <coughs> between the CL3 and the OVE? Um, so I've looked at a lot of the light curves, and I, I, I see very similar um, behavior between some of these and OVBs in that, you know, the, I mean, this one, you can see just with, in one observing season, you know, like one or two months or something here, it, it jumps by almost half a magnitude, which is, it's very rare, but that's the sort of thing you see in optically violent variables. So this one, of course, is radio quiet, so I can't tell you what, what the radio, yeah, there's presumably no radio. <coughs> um, that doesn't mean that there isn't some low-level radio flux that's doing something similar to these objects. Um, yeah, I, I, that's, <laughs> I'm not an expert in that, so I, I don't know. I don't think anyone does. <laughs> All right, if we don't have any more questions, well, let's take 10 kills again. So it's a, a great pleasure to welcome our next speaker, uh, who is Professor Jeremy Butterfield from Trinity College at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Jeremy is a philosopher and has worked uh, in the context of philosophy of physics on philosophical aspects of quantum field theories, relativity, classical mechanics. Uh, he uh, taught, taught us yesterday at the DHI Philosophy Mini Workshop about uh, some recent work of his in the context of symmetries and dualities. This is a work in collaboration with Sebastian Pissarro. Who's a visiting fellow here and also in the audience. Uh, and, uh, and he's spent a lot of time at Cambridge. I think he did a PhD at the University of Cambridge, joined the faculty there, uh, and has also spent time uh, at Oxford, Princeton, Pittsburgh, and the University of Sydney. Uh, Jeremy's visiting for some time. He'll be here till the 1st of November. So if you have any burning philosophical questions, you should hunt him down. He's in uh, the Mercer's old office just around the corner. Uh, and today he'll be telling us about a particular solution to the quantum measurement. Thank you very much for us and uh, a very gracious and generous introduction. Uh, glad to hear Sydney, for others, hometown mentioned there. Uh, I came back to Cambridge from my one visit to Sydney and I said to my dear witty colleague, who had a very good deadpan sense of humor, just back from uh, Sydney, back to Fenland, I said, why did you come back? <laughs> I miss the flat whites. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited and grateful. Uh, 
listening to Chelsea's talk, uh, two things came to mind, of course. Uh, one was the old Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Mm -hmm. And the other one is long established from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> but Adrian Kent in Applied Maths Department in Cambridge is a supremely good foundations of quantum theory researcher. And some uh, five years ago, uh, he began a series of three papers listed there, which make a, a proposed solution to the quantum measurement problem. And I uh, wrote a year ago a paper that uh, advertises and examines this with, from one perspective, which is a very Austin perspective, because it's uh, the late lamented Abner Shimoni, who 30 years ago, struggling with the conflict between uh, quantum non-locality and special relativity so, uh, said, I hope for peaceful coexistence between quantum theory and relativity, which is a very 1970s, 1980s phrase, uh, Cold War, ad uh, adapted from the Cold War. But So what I want to do is to urge uh, the merits of Ken's view, uh, but from the perspective of this question, peaceful coexistence. Um, it's also true that last year Brendan Marsh was in Cambridge, now he's at Stanford, and he had a good idea about a cousin proposal, an adjustment that you could make to, um, to Adrian. So the thing about Adrian's proposal is that if you have done uh, some reading and thinking about the quantum measurement problem, you'll know that there are these various views, Copenhagen, Everett, the Pilot Way, and whatnot. And in fact, the great bell in his Six Possible Worlds of Quantum Mechanics, which I'd recommend to everybody, uh, says here are six possible interpretations. And it's the kind of thing you can give your non-scientific relatives. There's not a single equation in it. And the six alternatives are arranged in three pairs. And in each pair, there is a romantic alternative and an unromantic alternative. So I won't go into his taxonomy more, but it's a, it's a terrifically good read. So I am in a one-man campaign to get philosophers of quantum theory away from the usual suspects of that half dozen and to look at some alternatives, of which Kent is one. He was, wishes to be philosophically realistic, not to have Everetti in many worlds, and yet to respect relativity. The pilot wave theory is the closest cousin in the familiar usual suspects list. Uh, it is realistic, it is one world, but as we all know, it has difficulties in respecting uh, Lorentz invariants. So what is Kent's idea? He is going to say that orthodox quantum theory without a physical process of state vector collapse, without a collapse of the wave packet, without state reduction, uh, leads, of course, to the Schrodinger's cat threat of macroscopic superpositions you want to get rid of, and the way to have definiteness for the quantities that intuitively in your classical worldview and your everyday thinking you want to be definite in value, the way to get those values is not to have a non-unitary collapse of the state of a strictly isolated quantum system, but to add some values beyond quantum orthodoxy like the pilot wave theory does. It says that there are actually point particles with a definite intrinsic actual position at all times, which evolves indeed deterministically and continuously. And this is additional to the Schrodinger evolution of the quantum state. So Kent also will add values. Now, uh, Actually, Bell introduced, as many of you will know, the word beable to mean physical quantity that is not merely instrumentalistically conceived, like the word observable in your quantum theory textbook normally connotes some kind of uh, merely uh, uh, instrumental meaning. So we talk about physical quantities that actually have definite values being beables, following Bell. Um, but the, the prescription for what these beables are will be Lorentz invariant and ve very different from the point particle having a definite position. Uh, actually, uh, it's um, 
rather curious because the, the uh, framework will propose in the spirit of Aharonov and co-workers these many decades, a sort of time-symmetric view of quantum theory where you are allowed to invoke final boundary conditions with just the contentment and intellectual ease and taking in your stride that you normally in physics have for initial conditions. Right? So there's going to be an invocation of a final boundary condition. And this will be, I want to convey this to you kind of for reasons of clarity of exposition in a sort of stepwise way. There will be a final boundary condition. It will be a matter of happenstance what it is, contingency. In fact, the probability for what it is will be given by the ordinary orthodox Born rule, ordinary quantum probabilities, the squared length of the projection into the eigenspace concerned for the quantum state at that very late time. And what is the quantity for which we are concerned with its final boundary condition? Uh, en uh, mass energy density. <coughs> so you are to imagine a very late hypersurface, call it S, <coughs> spread across the cosmos on which, now there won't be a physical measurement there, but there is, in Kent's mind, our mind, a notional projection postulate, so-called Luder's rule measurement, at every point of mass energy density, and with the space-like commutation, they're all simultaneously measurable in principle. And you are therefore to imagine that God, nature, Kent, your mind, notionally measures on this very late surface mass energy density. And by happenstance, in accordance with Born rule probabilities, a certain definiteness occurs there. So, how is this different from many worlds? To uh, me, that's the same thing. Ah, well, there are there are different ways it could have happened, but only one happens. Just like in the pilot wave, there are many places the point particles could be, but there's one particular place they are, and that's what yields the individual definiteness. But in many worlds, again, I would say, there are many worlds, but the only one I care about is the one that I followed, and that's the definiteness. Okay, uh, th that is a deep philosophy question about okay. the difference between the actual and the possible. Possible, yeah. 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 Okay. So, coffee afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, um, I'm not sure what, I, I'm not saying I have an answer to that. I'm just saying uh, I'm going to preserve my advertising campaign for Adrian by <laughs> saying uh, it, I, I don't believe he is a. It, it's not, uh, it is distinguishable in many nuts and bolts ways from Edward, even if you think there is a deep philosophy um, smearing there between anything like this and Edward. Um, so there's this late time distribution of mass energy. Now, the point here is to envisage that the mass energy, as it's in fact distributed on this late surface, records the arrival of photons on that surface. And as we learn in decoherence physics, which is of course a big thing in foundations now, we have uh, macroscopic objects such as a pointer of some apparatus that can either be left or right, the two outcomes of some traditional quantum philosophy discussion. And if it's on the left, the photons of reflect off it in such and such a way and go to its spatial infinity. And if it's on the right, they reflect it off it in blah blah way, some other way, and go off to spatial infinity. So where the photons land on this very late hypersurface, if you think classically, in a straightforward piece of op kind of ray optics, where the photons land records whether the p position of the pointer was this or was this. So the idea is there is a fact of the matter about the late surface. And there are then correlations of an orthodox quantum kind, looking back, think classically about ray optics, to uh, where the photon came from, and therefore how it bounced, and therefore was the pointer there or there. And so at intermediate times in the history of the cosmos, there will be a definiteness, which is riding as a logical corollary on the late time being definite. Okay, so that's the picture. Uh, when you study decoherence, you, you learn about what Despagne uh, in the 
70s called the an improper mixture, the reduced density matrix that you obtain for a quantum system by partial tracing over its environment uh, is perhaps, and this is the whole point of decoherence physics, it is nearly diagonal in the quantity that you intuitively wish to have be definite in value, such as the position of the center of mass of a pointer of an apparatus when you trace over the air molecules and electromagnetic field that forms its environment. So it's nearly diagonal in the quantity you intuitively wish to have a definite value to solve the measurement problem. But Despagna teaches us wisely, you can't actually interpret this matrix as ordinary classical ignorance, so-called uh, classical randomness, so-called ignorance interpretability, which is how you normally are first introduced to the density matrix as uh, there is always some individual case, one or the other, and it is merely a, 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 what they would call in philosophy a kind of ignorance mixture of different alternatives. But you can't interpret the components of a density matrix like that. We, we've learned from Despagna and others. But we are, with this prescription, getting an official uh, uh, co logically coherent, logically consistent specification of an extra value. So that's what Kent is about. And, and the point of this paper is, a, is to um, uh, look at this in the context of quantum non-locality and then to explore Marsh's cousin proposal of the postulated boundary condition. So, sorry, I've, I've uh, given a lot of, uh, what should I say, uh, uh, preamble. So there'll be four sections, and uh, maybe the trick is to finish at 2.30. Am I right to finish at 2.30 normally? Yeah, before the yeah. I, I think what I'll try and do is I'll try and tell you about Kent's proposal and never mind the second half. But we have some pictures about how Kent's proposal actually works. But let's begin by talking about Shimoni 30 years ago, uh, saying that if you look at the proofs of a Bell inequality, and this is imagined now to be uh, a traditional two wing EPR Bohm Bell experiment in which as it might be, uh, there's a source in the centre, there are two wings. Uh, this is the kind of experiment that was done, for example, famously by Aspe in 1981, with a 12 metre long optical bench in Paris, in which the switches that control <coughs> what was actually chosen to be measured, these switches operated at space-like separation. <coughs> so it would be hard to argue that the uh, uh, choice of setting in one wing was uh, correlated with the choice of setting in the other wing. Um, in any case, we therefore have outcomes, at big X, big Y, X on the left, Y on the right. We have settings, little x, little y, uh, on, on the left and right, respectively. And when you prove a Bell inequality, you prove what, uh, the, what is called uh, conditional stochastic independence, or factorizability, that the probability for a double wing experiment of getting big X and big Y. Big X is plus or minus one, big Y is plus or minus one. It's a two outcome experiment for a spin or polarization measurement. The probability of the conjunction is a product. And it's not just a, a product of that double wing scenarios experiments for X and Y, but notice that the subscripts have changed. Little lambda is the complete state of the particle pair. It's the notional full information that you envisage a so-called hidden variable theory to postulate. And on the right of equation one, you've got one factor which concerns uh, an experiment with only the left m machine on, measuring little x. Uh, could be one setting or another, but there is no right machine turned on. And the second factor is the uh, probabilities for an experiment in which the left machine is turned off and there is only a measurement of little y setting one or another uh, on the right. So in any case, this is trivially the conjunction of two things, says uh, Shimoni, parameter independence and outcome independence. Parameter independence uh, means independence of the distance setting. Parameter here means knob setting humanly choosable which quantity do I measure. Outcome means the genuine result that you read off. And uh, parameter independence is a uh, statement 
that the marginal probabilities in, in a single wing are independent of what is chosen to be measured in the distant wing. And it corresponds to what uh, you learn in quantum theory as the no-signaling theorem, that the local statistics are independent of what you choose to measure elsewhere, which is a provable property of quantum theory. If you put little lambda equal to the quantum state and go through ordinary quantum mechanics, you'll find that the commutation of quantities on the left system and the right subsystem enforces parameter independence. Outcome independence is a is equation three is a factorization which involves only the double experiment. All the subscripts are little x and little y throughout in equation three, and it is just sheer probabilistic independence for a given pair of settings in the two wings of the two outcomes. And it's manifestly false in a, in a non-product state. So uh, that's the, that's the uh, contrast. And Shimoni suggested, well, we should simply deny outcome independence and keep parameter independence. The pilot wave theory makes exactly the opposite verdict in a perfectly respectable and comprehensible way as Bell himself urged, right? Um, in the pilot wave theory, outcome independence holds, but parameter independence fails in a way that is explicit and comprehensible uh, because the little lambda is now far more than the orthodox quantum state. It includes the positions of the point particles, and these give extra information. And after completing a right-wing measurement, the, say a stern gerlach the point particle has either been swept upwards in a magnetic field or downwards in a magnetic field, and the velocity of the left particle is P equals grad S, as in hamilton jacobi theory, and where in configuration space you evaluate grad S is sensitive to where its twin, its distant cousin, the right particle, happens to be. And therefore there is a completely... Uh, well, non-relativistically, it's utterly instantaneous, like Newtonian gravity, but there's no dropping off with distance, but there's no mystery. It's right there in the pilot wave formalism that there is a sensitivity to where the other particle, point particle that is part of your composite system is in space. So there's, there's the, the point really is that equations one to three are utterly schematic. Lambda is completely schematic just as much, indeed, little x, little y, big x, big y, bit schematic, but the main thing is little lambda is schematic, could be a quantum state, could be a pilot wave state, could be some Kentian state, and then you just see what the verdicts are, but you hope not to have assumptions endorsed that would lead to a Bell inequality, because that's violated by experiment. So anyway, Bell, in his uh, late work, uh, wrote things that, which had the spirit, I'm summarizing, uh, well, nature doesn't care about the difference between a humanly choosable knob setting and an outcome. Its causal structure won't much care about that contrast. With the very notion outcome, the schematic nature of that uh, notation suggests we would need a solution to the measurement problem. And, okay, Shimoni had his own wishes for a state reduction, but I would follow Kent into a state non reduction the governing assumption uh, that I haven't mentioned in proving a Bell inequality is that the measure over the little lambdas, which you average over in order to deduce observable statistics, because after all, you don't know what the little lambda is in any individual trial. This source is spitting out lots and lots of pairs of particles. Each one is encoded with some value of little lambda, the complete state. You don't know with what frequencies the various lambdas come out. So you average over the lambdas to get the observable probabilities for outcomes. You have to assume that the, the probability uh, rho over the little lambdas is not uh, correlated with what setting you choose to measure in the two wings. If it were, it would be easy. Uh, it, 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 if it were, it would not be possible to deduce a Bell inequality, and it would be easy to reconcile the hidden variable description with the experimental violation of that. So, uh, if you believe that the causal factors that govern your choice of settings are localized in the two wings, and you believe that little lambda encodes uh, the central source, 
then it's easy to believe that the causal factors affecting the knob settings are not really entangled or correlated with the causal factors controlling little lambda. But suppose that uh, little lambda, as in Kent, encodes a final boundary condition, which is what's going to happen. Lambda is going to be a mega thing, way late and very logically rich. It's going to be a specification of one way mass energy density could be spread across a, a cosmic late hypersurface, then little lambda will encode, so to speak, oh, photons arrived here, registering that Fred, back in 2018, chose that knob setting, as against this other knob setting he might have chosen. So little lambda would encode knob settings. So this assumption is normally called no conspiracy. And of course, the, the language is very suggestive. No conspiracy sounds like an assumption that only the mad would deny, right? A conspiracy theorist. So it's a rather tendentious label, because once Lens, little lambda is postulated to be very late, it's just fine to violate no conspiracy. Of course, little lambda will encode what quantities were uh, earlier chosen to be measured. Okay, so let's get Kent's proposal for a couple of minutes. It, as I, I've said this before, it's realistic, it's one world, it has no state reduction, it, a, a, a quantum system will always uh, evolve in a unitary way, which is strictly isolated. It's like the pilot wave theory, but it's relativistic and with very different definite quantities. There is a postulated state of the universe, universal quantum state, which evolves unitarily. It determines Born rule probabilities for mass energy density on a very late hypersurface, call it S. One of these distributions nature selects. There are many other facts, however, beyond that late one, but they're all the facts you get as correlated by orthodox quantum probabilities, typically strict ones is what we'll be examining, strict correlation. Uh, they're all uh, correlated with, with that by, so to speak, uh, the uh, physical picture of what the photons arriving late record about earlier events. So um, the overall task in solving the measurement problem with unitary quantum mechanics in a one world way is to say what are the extra values that solve the measurement problem. This is really a matter, as Adrian puts it, of setting up a sample space and a probability distribution over it. So by postulating S and a Born rule distribution over the various possible mass density distribution, energy density distributions across it, he's essentially setting up a classical probability space. Now, I should say, officially, Kent is a wise and sophisticated person. He doesn't say there is some uh, golden hypersurface late. He says, no, probably not. Uh, there is a sequence of ever later hypersurfaces. And I'm hoping that the prescription I give for a single hypersurface in my talk so far, applied to the sequence of hypersurfaces, will lead to a convergent collection of distributions. It's also true, I should have said this, especially in BHI cosmological people around me, there is no suggestion that this must work for any cosmos. He's quite explicit in his papers that the thing depends upon, for example, there being three spatial dimensions and not an awful lot of obstacles, so that for the kinds of things you and I wish to have definite in value, such as the center of mass of, of all our individual fingers, there needs to be spatial directions and few enough obstacles, enough spatial directions, few enough obstacles for photons to escape to infinity, unimpeded enough to register on the hypersurface so that by strict quantum correlation, what we wish to be intuitively definite at intermediate space-time points is, is, so is definite. Would that mean no black holes? Yes. Uh, well, he isn't explicit that it means no black holes, but he uh, he, he doesn't discuss. Okay, but I would suspect the black holes evaporate, so you wouldn't have... Uh, if they evaporate, it's okay. okay. Then you can have a hypothesis. No, you can because the universe will not survive for that long. <laughs> okay. He's he assuming that he, he has to assume that the universe will last forever to have this limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think he is assuming that. I think yeah. There's the some discussion in the paper. What about Poincare recurrences? 
Doesn't that approach it from things from the other one? Prohibit things from approaching a definite limit. Correlation function has to have spikes, spikes at x minus three long. Uh, yes, I, it's a good question. I don't know what I think you should say about that. Thank you. Yeah. He certainly doesn't, as I recall, discuss Poincaré recurrence issues explicitly. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I'll finish up two minutes ago. Um, yeah, so this is a good slide to end on, actually, because it ends with a joke. Um, so, uh, there's a... So this is now spelling out what I said earlier out loud. There's a Luders rule measurement late. Uh, it determines when the photon scattered off macroscopic objects at intermediate times and defines a probability space. I spoke about how the improper mixture jargon of Despania records something that is recognized by all decoherence theorists nowadays, that you cannot give the proper mixture, you cannot give the reduced state of the uh, system after you partially trace out the environment, you can't give it a, uh, uh, the uh, happy-go-lucky, oh, we've solved the measurement problem because it's nearly diagonal in the point of position basis. I have achieved an, uh, an individual definite point of position in every individual run of my experiment. You can't say that because it's not interpretable in that, matter, in that manner. But by adding these extra facts, we're overcoming that logical objection. And Landsman, in his uh, review some years ago of Schlossauer's excellent decoherence Springer uh, monograph, a kind of review of the physics of decoherence, begins with these telling words. Uh, decoherence is like capitalism. Its proponents regard it as obvious, given human nature and its success seems overwhelming. Competitors largely belong to the past or get the impression that they do. Consequently, although serious analysis finds deep flaws in it, that's the Dispania point, the promise of huge benefits continues to attract new adherents with the naivety of those who enroll in a pyramid scheme. <laughs> so I had to share that with you, even though I think it's a bit unfair because most decoherent theorists aren't, aren't that naive. Okay, so uh, I, I will just leave you with this picture of late S and the intermediate time, and there's the late surface S, and it's the condition of the mass energy on that late surface about which we have the definiteness such that with strict correlations from that, we determine facts to be definite at the point Y. And there are toy models of a macroscopic superpositions, uh, to, you know, the con conical two-hump wave packet of a macroscopic superposition of, deep, of localization, the failure to be localized, having it resolved by a photon bouncing off one hump and registering later, and thereby rendering definite that, as it might be, it was the left hump uh, that, that gets localized at intermediate times. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry for the answer. So in the real world, uh, this hypersurface where we can measure things, uh, you know, might be in the distant future, we might not be around. And if you want to be practical, you can't rely on that because you, you're not there yet. Yes. And yes. So, how do you understand what's going on yes. now yes, that's without good. having yeah. that information? Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is a very, uh, very central good question. And uh, actually, Adrian doesn't, in his three papers, uh, spell it out, but my paper tries to spell out what I'm sure is going on, and he hasn't uh, dissented in discussions. Uh, uh, it's a bit, the analogy is with the pilot wave. I mean, roughly speaking, we only know a tiny fragment of this actual, as Gelman and Harper might say, quasi-classical history that is according to this prescription meant to be recovered. So we don't know the quasi-classical intermediate history in which we're uh, immersed, mostly. And we certainly don't know about the, the, the happenstance of how it turns out to be in mass energy density across big S later. So one should simply envisage Kent as recovering the uh, actual empirical success of quantum theory while having definite values in the manner of the pilot wave theory by averaging with born rule probabilities over the various alternatives. 
So he had a Born rule probability distribution for the various ways the later surface could be definite about mass energy density. And we are to envisage, I mean, all this, of course, is horrendously uncalculable, but we are to envisage a Born rule averaging over how it might later be as determining, uh, as in the pilot wave theory, the, pro the empirical probabilities of the lab. And we uh, imagine that just as the pilot wave theory can give an argument, that its observable probabilities will be close to the orthodox quantum theory, because you can't control the position of the point particles, so also here. That, that would be the vision. But it's completely uncalculable. And uh, it's a very good question. I just want to make sure I understood the argument here. So the old paradox in the you know the LA and aspect experiment, for instance, you got this central source, it sends out two particles, they are causally disconnected, and some measurements are made, and somehow quantum mechanics does something very surprising. Right? I mean this is the original Bell Bell Bell's inequality. So here what has happened now is you're not trying to make these two guys talk to each other. Rather, you're saying each measurement, or whatever you want to call it, S mm -hmm. infinity, mm -hmm. is talking to the original source. And those are causally connected. And therefore, that boundary condition can influence the lambda here. Mm -hmm. Similarly, this fellow can influence the lambda here. And at least you're now respecting the relativity. Is that the key idea uh, here? It's not as, as, in the form it comes to us from Kent, yeah. uh, it isn't, okay. because Kent doesn't talk about, and you're right to do so, one imagines perhaps subluminal particles coming out like this. Yeah. So uh, they are well able to have a look along the backward light -like correlation exactly. to uh, events that are even later than the emission event. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually doesn't discuss, this is part of the, the reason I want to write my paper, he doesn't discuss the Bell experiment. Uh, he only talks about, as it might be, the canonical two-hump superposition uh, being rendered definite by the fact that it scatters some photons of the CMB uh, off to spatial infinity that later register. So he, all, he doesn't look at composite quantum systems and their curiosities, such as Bell. Uh, he only looks like I just said. Uh, my paper uh, discusses a Bell experiment in which you would therefore, I mean, the natural way to do it is to have a two component system, but to encode for any given knob setting quantity chosen to be measured, the two possible results in localization either left or right or up or down. And over on the other wing, similarly, a left or right or up or down. So then the uh, recording of a result, a, def a result being definite at intermediate time, can be secured by having a photon notionally bounce off one hump, get later recorded, nature, fortune, the deity, the happenstance of later, the correlation, and then it... But, but it is, nobody has yet written down, I, I kind of uh, lost momentum in this paper, uh, nobody's written down a formal model of a Bell inequality which actually looks at different settings and therefore evaluates whether there is parameter independence. I think you can argue that there is object. It should work. It should work. There is it seems outcome easier to me, yeah. instead of going to this you know, mythical future yeah. hypersurface. Here's the experiment I did. And these two experimental whatever, knobs, measurements, whatever, were causally connected with the original source. And I just invoke this kind of you know backward propagating boundary condition and you solve it, right? Yeah. Should be doable. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, in the same spirit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you keep you keep the settings as superpositions or you actually make them. No. Different? This guy, because it's kind of connected with the future, it knows what setting you have selected, mm -hmm. what measurement you made, whatever. And that will modify my original quantum mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. to be compatible. Mm -hmm. That's the lambda. Yeah. That is somehow sensitive to the future, yeah. little x, big x, yeah. whatever. Yeah. I think uh, 
uh, Adrian would probably resist that this is that this is how he wants to think. I mean, he's a very liberal as well as quick. He's not a dogmatic person at all. He's very flexible. But you will perhaps know there is Costa de Beauregard uh, in France, and now in Cambridge, England, Hugh Price, a philosopher, urging that the Bell inequality could be overcome by a suitably time-symmetric block universe view in which you, the correlation through the source is invoked. Yes. Uh, That's what I think I was saying. I, yes. yeah, oh, and yeah. I think Adrian regards himself as different from that. Okay. But he hasn't in print yes. done a compare and contrast. Alright, so well, uh, Jeremy will be around for the first of November, as I mentioned, so if you think of any other questions, you should feel free to, to find him, and uh, perhaps we can thank him once again. Yeah, I'm going to